This is Noah Schechter, writer of episode 705, Norman Devane. You're listening to The Blacklist Exposed on Golden Spiral Media. And see, this is exactly why you should never send your kids to boarding school. Welcome to the award-winning The Blacklist Exposed podcast. I'm Agent Troy Heinrichs. And I'm Special Agent Rory filling in for Aaron this week. I subscribe to the Wrestler School for Dating Women. Why not? It's going to be a gas. Thanks for joining us once again as we discuss number 138 on the blacklist, Norman Devane. It was written by Noah Schechter and directed by Kurt Kenny. Show notes and other intel for this episode of The Blacklist Exposed can be found at theblacklistexposed.com. Aaron's out this week. He's got pneumonia. Uh, maybe Oof. he should be getting some shots from either Spalding Stark or this guy, Norman Devane, this week. Yeah, I guess my check cleared. <laughs> <laughs> on this episode, we'll cover off on our profiling question from last week with thoughts from all of you. Dig deep into this week's case profile, which seemed a little bit soft in my opinion, but we'll get mm. there in a bit. Uh, we'll play a little bit of what happens next. And of course, special agent Intel and Red's rhetoric at the end of the show. So with that, we had a big question last week, a big photo drop at the end of the episode. So what say the audience, Rory? Well, the question was, is Red Ilya Koslov? And only 7% say without a doubt or 100% yes, which means 93% of you said no way in hell. Okay, okay. So I, I have to take, take a moment here. So for like six to seven seasons, I've been like, Red's definitely Katarina. And it right. was like we were the minority. <laughs> and now you're <laughs> saying that I'm still in the minority? <laughs> because Either way, you're just a minority person. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> my life is so horrible. <laughs> Seven um, percent. Wow, that's really interesting. I thought more people would buy into like I'm just done theorizing about it, and I want it to be what it is. I think that I mean you're always going to have the outliers, but I think it really came down to if that is Katarina, which I know some people don't believe it is, but if it was in fact Katarina and Dom's story, then she would know that Red was Ilya. Right, and I think that's what Aaron's point was last week. She says the same words about that he's the only person that the information that I need or I can get it from. And that was a kind of a reflection of what she says in the opener. So is that supposed to tell the audience, you know, this is Ilya, right? Because she uses the same language. Right. I, I think that was part of it was just simply to let the audience know like, Hey, she would know. So this is two separate people. Interesting. Because I, why would she need a photo? Right. Cause I would say that I'm probably still in the Ilya camp at this point only because the season has been clipping along really well. Right. So it's right. been, you know, makes sense that he's captured and then it makes sense that like I was talking about that for uh, LaFleur de Mall that red's missing or red. They, they still need red to get Intel in order to find the woman. But then last week, you know, red's good and they can't find the woman. So they're going to go ahead and try to turn him into main justice. This week is like left field, right? We get a big cliffhanger at the end of the episode. There's no Katarina. Right. You assume Ilya is going to be in this episode because of the way the story has been progressing. And I think that's the symptom of our binge mentality, right? We had, I mean, it's November 2nd. Yeah. Everything from Apple TV plus just landed. Jack Ryan just showed up. Uh, we got his dark materials and the Watchmen on HBO and people no, just want to go, 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 go. Right. So now it's right. like, wait, where's I, you sit down today and you're like, where's Ilya? Right. But you say that, but what if Ilya was actually in the episode this week? Ah, we'll get to that. We'll get to that. <laughs> so uh, what, what are some of the other thoughts from the, the people on the profiling question? Well, Sharon Crady said, I need a third choice because there's not enough evidence to make a clear decision right now. Richard said, or a fourth choice, potentially. I just don't care anymore. <laughs> people are starting to get on board with that one. Anti Cartaxo said, no idea. Directly after watching Ravisette, I thought so. Now I'm not so sure. And of course, Douglas chimed in and said, hundred percent. Absolutely not. Red Arena lives. <laughs> yeah, I have a feeling you've been moved uh, to the back of the train and uh, Douglas has taken over driving that. Hey, you know what? It, it, it's a long process. Sometimes being a good leader means you have to succeed leadership to those that are coming up from behind and just enjoy retirement and collect a pension. I never knock anybody for sticking by their theory. No, no. And we got some interesting ones this week as we get into the show. So what's our profiling question for next week, Rory? So next week's profiling question, what will Aram do with the intel he acquired? 
Yeah, we're going to talk about that as well. Absolutely. <laughs> but uh, thanks for all that answer. Before one of us gets wheeled out in a laundry cart, let's go ahead and dig into this week's case profile. All right, Dateline, Season 6, Episode 3. Spalding Stark, a.k.a. number 124, the pharmacist, is apprehended and sent to jail, but not before delivering an experimental solution to one Red Reddington, who seems to be suffering from some sort of illness. Maybe something similar to Constantine Rostov? Potentially. Fast forward to last night and Spalding Stark is back and he's analyzing blood samples of Reddington's collected by the non-English urine and blood pusher Ernesto (laughs) to see if this trial drug worked or not. The answer? Well, let's hang on to that for a minute since this is a blacklist and we don't give any answers. So we meet an obsessive compulsive germaphobe who's similar in nature to the pharmacist. He's experimenting on people to find the right serums to fix all that ails him. Or in this case, may ail him in the future. His Mm. name is Norman Devane, and he likes needles a lot. (laughs) Turns out he hires a guy to hack the National Diagnostics Lab server farm to find 20 test subjects, all with B-negative blood type, all young white males, and all with close to the same genetic mapping as himself. Now, using a former colleague of his, whose child was actually saved by Devane, he sets up shop at the Abbott Boarding School in Virginia, the same place where those 20 boys were enrolled coincidence i don't think so not at all <laughs> so well, I, I think that was that was part of it was that they showed you in the beginning when he was offering the kid the scholarship obviously he did that with all the kids to get them to the school well absolutely it, it's it's like a recruiting program right are you white are you 20 and do you have b negative blood you're in <laughs> doesn't matter if you're a complete dumbass <laughs> yeah i mean that was the whole thing with the with the kids it's just weird how the only matches that he did find were the young kids. Well, and I think maybe as I reexamined it, cause I thought the kids was something more important that we're supposed to hone in on. And I think at the end of the day, it wasn't about the kids per se, as it was the boarding school because right. he had the facilities. So kids were the only natural conclusion because they had to get to the boarding school in order to be able to be procedured on. Performed yeah, absolutely. On. Yeah. <laughs> with the amount of people that he had access to, He's going to find more than just 20 young white kids, you know, that he could recruit to the school. What did you think of the concept overall? Did you like this week? I I think it, you know, if you look at it and you say, you know, he's using like genetic sequencing, blood types and all that, it kind of fits into the overlying theme of what Red was doing. It kind of like mirror image that. Oh, because of the fact that he has this mysterious illness or something going right. on with him, and right, it just seemed to like fat. It seemed to fit perfectly along those lines that we find out because I'll we'll talk about it later. But last season, it was kind of like, what's going on with Red? Why is he taking medication? Why is he taking shots? Now it was brought to the forefront, you know, with his illness. It seemed to mirror that, you know, and that's why they bring back, you know, the uh, the doctor. So that Red's getting tested because obviously there's something really wrong with him that we find out, but it just seemed to mirror that. So it was kind of nice on that, even though this might have been what people classify as a filler episode because there was no Katarina. It didn't move the story. It still fit nicely and gave us the information we need going forward. Yeah. Standalone episode is what I would call it. uh, A bottle episode. It's all contained. And I like the fact that they're bringing in stuff from the past and making it work so that we get this new information as part of the overall mythology. My issue with the episode, and this is nothing against the writers or the room or anybody. My issue is, is that we talked about this last season about pace and about right. setting a tone of a story in a, in a pattern. We know we got probably somewhere in the neighborhood of like, you know, nine to 12 episodes before Christmas, before we go on break. And it seems like the perfect thing to have a cohesive, you know, 10 to 12 episode story arc, We get left with a huge cliffhanger last week with Ilya's picture and Katarina saying, this is the only guy we need and we got to find him, right? And and Katarina's been in every episode thus far this season. And then we just kind of go, and the car like (laughs) crashes into a dumpster, Tom style. And the whole story just stops. So I don't know if if, if I, I just didn't enjoy the episode because of that. Or if, because because there's parts of this episode where I laughed out loud. It was hysterical. Oh, I definitely did. It was so good from that regard. 
But in the terms of context of story, maybe this is the stuff that John talked about in his season six ending interview where maybe Lila Robbins wasn't available to film this week. And maybe um, budgets were saying, hey, we have to like, you know, put in this bottle episode and just kind of bring out part of the mythology in a different way. And, and right. I totally respect that. It just when you when you have this age of binge watching, right, everything just dropped like we were talking about, right? You have all the Apple TV stuff just dropped and you have all this stuff and Disney Plus is coming out next week. And there's just so much uh, when you want to call it competition right. for eyeballs, it's like when you're in that mythology heavy stuff, when you have the non mythology episode, the show kind of suffers a little bit in my opinion. Yeah. I mean, it, it does, but I mean, we've, we've talked about this even when I was, you know, on the podcast before is that, you know, when you have 22 episodes, you can't be all about the mythology. You can't do 22 episodes, which is why a lot of shows cut down to, you know, 16 episodes to remove some of those bottle filler episodes, you know, with it, which is kind of important. But with this, it was just weird how it was back to back with Kuwait. So even though Kuwait moved the storyline and answered it like they're answering things going backwards to bring us forward. Yeah. And this one definitely reached back into the annals of the blacklist lore in order to make some ties. But before we get into the characters, let's talk about our music for this week. Our first song came during the cold open as we hear you drive me crazy by the Grand Prix. And then our second song came when Aram, <laughs> I mean, uh, Mr. <clears throat> Bloom and Mrs. Bloom uh, dance at the wedding. Uh, we're treated to a classic wedding song. Hold me now from the Thompson twins. I'll admit I sang along with that one. Did you find it weird at all? I mean, it, it just, it felt like very non blacklisty, but at the same time, it was a perfect for the setting. Oh, it was definitely perfect for the setting. It was just, you know, it's a fun song. I like that song. So I like when they introduce music that I actually know. I was like, Thompson twins. <laughs> That's different. <laughs> I was waiting like for a shot of the band. Oh, you know, that would be sweet. It. I would, that would be great. Yeah. Thompson <laughs> twins are actually playing the wedding. Yep. That was so good. I mean, I mean, with the with the money that was put into this wedding, you assume that that could have been a possibility. Yeah. And, you know, I know people were talking about this, too. We have to go on the assumption that obviously because he said it was his daughter's wedding, that that's his cover name is Mr. Bloom. Correct. Absolutely. Which is pretty fun because I always see him as Finch's best friend from Person of Interest. Uh, I'm still stuck on Lost Days. <laughs> Good old I, yeah, I still see him from because I love person interest and I've watched it so many times that I still see him as that character. All right. Well, you can find all the great music from the blacklist on the playlist, both on Spotify and Apple Music. Just go over to the website at the blacklist dot com and you'll see those over in the right hand column on the desktop or scroll all the way to the bottom if you're on the mobile. And with that, let's talk about Cooper or let's not talk about Cooper because <laughs> you know how it always goes, right? Big up last week and then absolutely nothing this week. Yeah. I mean, he was pretty much just wallpaper What we get like two quick shots of him. Yeah. Barking out the orders and moving things along, but where the money is, is in futures and Dembe has a future in trading futures, <laughs> pork belly futures to be exact. Oh, so funny. He's bringing home the bacon for red this week. Oh my gosh. <laughs> That's supposed to be my job. I'm supposed to have a bad dad joke. <laughs> Bring it home the bank. Oh, <laughs> uh, well, I can tell you one thing though that uh, with with you know Dembe's military background and he's just you know always making sure to take care of guns whenever he's out there. He's really pissed off at the way Red has a complete lack of disregard for firearms. Oh, that was that was the first laugh out loud I actually did when I watched the episode because I was like, wait, what? Wait, wait, he just shot the guy in the head. <laughs> But and part of me was trying to figure out was was he was it an accident for real or was it intentional? I mean, I I, I initially was like taken aback by it, and I literally started laughing that I paused the episode, and then I started watching it, and I was like, oh wait, he really didn't mean to shoot. I, he probably would have shot him in the head at the end anyway, but he didn't get the information for, first. Uh, well, that's why I thought maybe he did shoot him because maybe he had enough information because he he shoots the guy at the end of the episode, right? He shoots Devane, yeah. so it, it's just like. I just love when he like the gun goes off and, and Spader just like <laughs> he's got this like giant belly laugh about it. It was really funny. It's like, hey, bench guy, you got a little brain on your shirt. Oh, my God. <laughs> For a minute there, I thought he shot. I thought he shot Brett Cullen's character. <laughs> <laughs> when he jumped backwards and it was too funny too that the guy happens to be a salt and pepper shaker aficionado like oh, what is that so great <laughs> that was so great i mean i there, i'm not gonna lie i got like four or five different salt and pepper shakers myself so i i get the concept so right 
No, but, but I mean, this guy, like for, and especially for red to know about these things, he's, t- and he, he, it's so, f- he has a story for every situation that he's in. He's the, he would be a great car salesman. This is one of those, when you go back and you talk about, I, I can't remember which the interview, which interview it was when we asked the, the, the room and John about like, what, how do they come up with these stories? Like, this is one of those where it's like, how do you just sit around and come up with a story about salt and pepper shakers? <laughs> right. And I saw there was a tweet, uh, by Kurt Kenny, the director of the episode. And he said, when you have, you know, Cullen and, and Spader in a scene, sometimes you're so enamored by it. You forget to call cut. <laughs> and they just keep going. <laughs> they just, they just keep going. Just like, Oh, wait a minute. Yeah, we're done. Well, speaking of people that are done, Katarina this week, first up, she hasn't been literally all over Liz in her apartment. She's finally stalking some other neighbors, potentially trying to find (laughs) a lay of the land. Um, But she does have an alias of Constance Strucker that she used back in 1986 to do business with Devane to find a cure for a friend of hers called Patrick Masada. So what do you think of this storyline? Do you think that this was enough to bring Katarina back into the fold and this Patrick Masada might be someone we have to pay attention to? Yeah, I I mean, I think we definitely, I mean, once we get names dropped, first I tried to use Constance Strucker and see if it was an anagram for anything, just in case, but it doesn't work for anything. Isn't it funny how that happens though? Because now that they did the (laughs) Louis T. Steinhill is the illusionist and now you have to go every single name you have to go put through some kind of meme name generator in order to figure stuff out. I, I, hate, right. I hate when they do that to us. <laughs> but with this show, especially they don't name drop for nothing. So obviously those are going to come back and play because even at the end of the episode, red references Masada. So, but you know, speaking of Katarina, sometimes even a revenge needs a week off, but you know, she's going to be back obviously. Oh, for sure. She's- it's just a question of where she goes with it. Is it that she's going to be on a mission to look for Ilya? Which do we see her in? Is she looking for Ilya actively or is she still, you know, nannying up to Agnes? I think the bigger question is, is because we got introduced to, or Katarina got introduced to Ilya last week and then we completely dropped the storyline. Are we going to see a hunt for Patrick Masada next week? Or are we just going to completely forget about it? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's the question. I mean, is is the blacklister going to be secondary? Is the blacklister going to be in the forefront and Mossad is going to be secondary? I think bringing this up because they're new to the show, I think it, there has to be some continuity where next week it's got to be that, you know, the focus on these these names, especially with the end where we'll get into a ROM. But, you know, there's going to be names in this that we're going to have to follow now. Right, because it kind of feels in that season three vein where it was like each week led into some uh, a lead for the next week in order to get to the point of being able to take down the cabal. So right, right. hopefully it's that same kind of concept here, even though this one was a little bit out of left field coming off of last week. I think that's why people were so enamored with season one, because at the end of season one, all of a sudden Liz has all the cases out and she realizes how each one interacts and ties to the next one. Right. And I kind of miss those days a little bit. That was, I mean, that was really good. I mean, if you go back and watch, and for those who haven't rewatched, now with the information that we have, going back and watching season one, it's all that much better. Oh, definitely. Uh, you know, who else was kind of lacking this week was Liz, right? Sadly, mm-hmm. she was sidecar once again this episode. A couple funny quips with Wrestler at Aram's expense, of course. Does a typical profiling FBI stuff, but no big realizations from her or connections back to Mama. Nope. Uh it isn't worth hunting for answers for a woman I've never known. It was probably the only line that really stuck out. What'd you make of that? I think it, it you know, I want to say that they're making a play off the audience because a lot of people, you know, have gone through the, the focus was my mother, my father. Now she knows about both and it doesn't seem to matter to her anymore. And I, and I can understand to a certain extent because she spent the last better part of the last six seasons focused on who my father, who my mother is, my family. And now she's starting to realize, like Tom told her, it doesn't really matter who we were. It's who we are, you know, now. But it was funny when Aram's telling her the story. I mean, here's Liz, you know, talking to her. And Liz is just happy that Aram's getting some. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> so I, I thought that was pretty funny, too. But as people have mentioned, and I noticed it too, that ever since the the episode where Dom gets shot, when we initially see Katarina and everything else, been a lacking about Red and Liz on screen time. Yeah, and what, what's happening to Dom? Is Dom still alive? Like he's just right. laying there? Yeah, he's just in the lumber yard hanging out. Are they like building houses around him, putting sheds together, and he's just sitting there in a the room. 
So this is the interesting conversation that we're having now kind of offline is this lack of Red and Liz in the screen together. Is that hurting the show at all? Because if Liz is supposed to be kind of number two in the billing, then and and, and the story's about her, shouldn't she not have bigger parts and bigger understanding? And I, it, it just seems like after she said, well, it doesn't matter who my mom was and it doesn't matter who he is. Right. I'm just like, okay, well then what's the point of Liz being in the show? Like, right. And, and you know, it, it is weird, but it's understandable to a certain extent because I mean, we were so focused heavy on them. Probably the first two, three episodes, then you had Kuwait, which really you wouldn't have any interaction with the two characters. And even on this episode, it's been more of focused on the act, you know, the actual Katarina Liz storyline more than the Red Liz. We're, we're already familiar with that one. Yeah, but at the same time, the, the show has been about like, why is he in her life specifically? So this doesn't really kind of feed that premise. And because of that, it li- literally relegates Liz to a background character. I, I mean, t- I don't think she was on screen any more than wrestler was on screen this week. And we always know wrestler gets pushed to the background. So no. I don't know if that's hurting the show or not. We'll have to let everybody else. Know. You can tweet us at, at the blacklist GSM, hit us up on the Facebook group. Let us know what you think about the lack of red and Liz on screen time uh, together. And if that's hurting the show at all. Yeah, I don't I don't see it as hurting the show because there's the primary focus has changed, you know, with it where it was always the dynamic between Red and Liz and what it read, you know, to Liz and everything like that. Now it's more like now you have Katarina introduced into the situation. So the situations have changed. And especially last week, it was the, you know, Harold Red show where Liz wouldn't be involved in that. And uh, I think he's trying to back off. Honestly, I think he's trying to keep her out of the loop. Simply because otherwise he's got to tell her that Katarina's around. I mean, I could I could buy that because she's the reason why this mess started in the first place. So because of that, that's why he's keeping her at bay. Right. right. And then you, you tie into last season where she gets him sent to death row. Right, exactly. And and I think that when you really put it all together, it's a challenge to figure out what this all means at the end of the day. So I'm okay with them not being on screen, but at the same time, I, I feel like when you look at the show, season one, season three, some of the best seasons, some of the best television, uh, you know, in this era from from a broadcast perspective, like that's when the show really works is when they're together. But right. when they're not together, you know, it it just is like, eh, eh, it's not doesn't it doesn't feel like blacklist to me. I think also I like I looked at it too, and I said, you know, I understand, and obviously it, it's it's obvious the lack of screen time between the two, but is it purposeful where red's keeping the distance because he knows Katarina is a threat. So he's trying to keep Liz out of the loop so that they don't have to, you know, they don't cross paths, obviously not realizing Katarina moved across the hall, which that bothers me a little bit simply because back in the day when you had, he moved Boz in across the way to keep an eye on her. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Right. Which you know, like- now he doesn't have anybody watching her back and Katarina's just free to move in across the hall and he's, she's babysitting for Agnes. That seems kind of a little bit strange for the show, but I'm just go, I'm just rolling with it at this point now. Well, let's move into somebody who's getting a little bit more play this season. Uh, literally. Oh, Ram goes from hero to zero in two weeks time because he hasn't called his sex mistress. <laughs> When he finally does, they crash a wedding as Mr. and Mrs. Bloom and Wilder accidentally intercepts the intel meant for the stranger, as he's called on the internets, played by <laughs> one Mr. Brett Cullen, as we mentioned. And the intel Bench gives guy. Aram a name that Reddington was basically the other fish on the line that he wanted to get. The man's name is Gregory Flynn, but really he goes by the name of Bertie Charnov. So what do you think of this? You know, it it strikes me as something strange, obviously, because what are the odds? First off, this woman was placed into the the world, the blacklist world by Red. So Aram gets in touch with her. We know what happens with that. But well, let me stop you there. What do you mean placed by Red? So Red gave them the information of the husband and wife who were part of the group. So they could infiltrate the group saying, you know, the husband was almost killed by the group. She would have a reason to get you into the group. So Red knew who she was. So does that play into it? 
Yeah, something seems strange with her because what are the odds they happen to show up at that right wedding and happen to take the Bloom name tags to get the intel? Okay, so I, I see your train of thought. You're saying that basically she was a plant by Red, so that way she Red could have like eyes inside the FBI potentially. Right. I, I I I guess I could buy that. To me, this seems like it has to be that or this is really contrived. The show is so smart that they really don't do anything for no reason at all. I mean, and as soon as the wedding, they they were at the wedding and she's telling him, I'm like, oh, wait a minute. I know where this is going. We just had wedding talk. I get it. At the same time, I feel like this was a reach. Like they, the show is super smart, but to me, this was like, oh, it was the first names on the top of the list, which I could totally buy, right? Because it's a B last name, yeah. so it, it works. And if that's the case, and this was written specifically, like, hey, we just happened to crash this wedding. It just happened to be the same one that the stranger, the bench guy, was going to be at uh, Red's friend, as he likes to call him, and just happens to bump into the guy that has the Intel. Now, granted the whole meetup signaling was I'm going to wear a name tag that says Mr. Bloom. So I can buy that as well. But to me, this was like, this is what what John had mentioned, right? This is the writing showing. This was like, Oh my gosh, did we just really manufacture this entire scene to have a ROM be in the middle of the situation? Because that was, that was the end point, right? That's the end point we have to get to. How does right. Red not get the information? Oh, maybe Aram gets the information. Okay, let's manufacture the scene around that. And to me, I was kind of taken out of the episode when this yeah, whole thing I mean, went just down. Too much coincidence there. Yeah, a lot. You know, with it. So it, obviously, it, it it it's done on purpose for a reason. I guess we'll see it play out because the question is going to be, you know, we'll talk about it later too. But what is Aram going to do with that? Yeah, and I love to hear the thoughts and theories from the fans because this was like. <sighs> This one was a stretch for me, a little bit, a little bit of a well, stretch. Well, that's the thing, too. Like, is it going to wind up that, you know, Rom's like, well, I guess I don't need this, and he just tosses it? And or it, does he do some investigating to find out what he was just handed? And what I'm really nervous about is the fact that if this woman was a plant, if this woman was truly put in place by Red or somehow related to something bigger going on, that already happened. We already saw that episode with um, Janet, right? With Elise. Right. So but that always happens. That that's that's you know Rom's mo. Aside from you know Samar, it's always been some kind of setup put in his life. Yeah, but I don't want to see it again. That's the thing. Like we we already <laughs> saw that story. Like he, he's he's grown, right? He literally saved her from a glass box by chucking a gun at it and being all James Bond like. Right. If Rom is moving forward and becoming a better person and a better field agent, then you can't have him move back into this gullible state. It just does a disservice to the character. Yeah, but, you know, at the same time, you look at it and say, if he was, you know, the a moral compass on the show, he's dating a married woman. Yeah. He's but, having an affair. But Liz is totally woman. okay with it. Come on. Right. Like, you like, know, Rest was like giving him advice on how to lie <laughs> about it. I mean, it's not a lie. He was kind of busy. He was working. He works a lot. I'm sure he does. But, you know, he was a lie. And he even told her on the phone. He's like, oh, yeah, my friend told me I should lie to you. But. Plus, you know, it's Virginia. You know, winter's coming. He can't ride his bike in the snow. So maybe he was at the <laughs> office a couple late nights. But it is it is funny that they put him in this situation that he's with a married woman. Like, he would be the last guy you would expect to have that kind of relationship. Yeah, but at the same time, you're you're in this, like, long-term relationship, and then it breaks up suddenly. I mean, you just got to get back out there. And, and sometimes things like this are what you want to do, right? You don't want to get back into another long-term relationship because you don't want to have your heart broken again. So sometimes... You know, a fling here, fling there. You're not married. It's totally fine. And and true. I mean, there's still the moral obligation, depending on how you feel about you know her husband and everything. But if Liz is okay with it, and Liz and Rom are typically best friends, I would say if Liz approves, then it's okay. I, I mean, I give a shout out to Amir because he's got some moves when he was dancing. He was breaking it down at the end. There you go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I, 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 from what I'm seeing on the screen, I'm seeing that you know this is a genuine relationship between the two of them. She's not a plant, and that, I think the writing was showing a little bit this week. It's opinion. quite possible. I just think it's the you know the the mo of the blacklist is you got to be skeptical about everything because nothing's what it seems. Right. All right, well then, wrestler, he's uh, giving out dating advice, right? How can someone so smart be so dumb? <laughs> I mean, this is your coworker. What if your coworker told you that on right. a regular basis? 
<laughs> it's funny how they've all evolved with you know with their relationships with one another and how they are like a family now. I'm standing right here. <laughs> classic no it was just funny when he pulls up the thing and her picture comes up on the thing he's like oh wait oh wait that was hysterical that was another one of those laugh out loud moments for me absolutely oh man so he basically says yeah go ahead and you can lie to her and liz doesn't approve of lying but it is a way to get around it and then he stabs devane with a needle full of the solution for that flesh-eating virus that was some nasty stuff good job by the makeup department this week yeah after he gets like sprayed in the face with like some hairspray but probably the scene that was the best of the entire entire episode was when he handcuffs himself to the guy and he's like, yeah, you know, this is going to be a gas. I've always been wanting to say that. <laughs> Again, I had to pause because I laughed out loud on that one, too. <laughs> oh, my gosh. So he's talking to Red later about his blood work and the file that he takes. And he says that he did not look at the file because sometimes you should just look the other way. What do you make of that line? Uh, he lied. <laughs> he definitely looked at the file because, you know, every one of us would look at that file. But mm. he looks the other way. But at the same time, you know, he peeked in there and saw it and was like, OK, something's going on here. Because the Boy Scout has looked the other way a lot when he read murders people, especially right in front of him. Interesting. I actually took it at face value, to be quite honest. I thought maybe he was truly like, I'm not going to look and I'm just going to hand it over because of the agreement that they had where wrestler said that he would keep his identity a secret, whether the identity is true or not. Mm. So I, I actually think that I believe wrestler. I think he was telling the truth that he did not look at the file. It, it, it's very possible, but I, I don't know. I don't know anybody who wouldn't look in the file. He peaked. Uh, maybe we we'll may do, not know what it says, but he peaked. Yeah, maybe we'll do two profiling questions this week to see what people feel about this. Do you think wrestler peaked or did not peak? <laughs> and I guess we'll have to see going forward if it plays into it anywhere. Yeah, because it, it, it would be similar to the storyline of, you know, oh, well, you told me not to chase down your grandfather, but I chased down your grandfather. It puts another perplexing moment between him and Liz and wrestler keeping secrets from Liz. So maybe he just didn't want to look because he didn't want to have to keep secrets from Liz anymore. Yeah, but, you know, I, the other thing, too, with, with Wrestler was when, Red, you know, Red basically tells him, you know, I don't want to, you know, have her worry, you know, about me that she's finally happy. And then, of course, the cut scene to Liz and Wrestler, she automatically says, I'm actually happy. And that's what Wrestler says, because, you know, he's going to tell her if he knows. Yeah, I mean, but even though he knows he's sick and there's something wrong with him, Wrestler was going to tell Liz at that moment until she obviously dropped that obvious line that I'm happy. And he was like, oh, wait, a minute. I'm not going to tell her. Got it. He knew something was up. All right. Well, let's talk about some real interesting stuff here, because Red is pretty much the big focus this week in the episode. And it turns out from our opening that we'll give you the answer now. Red <clears throat> is apparently dying. Dun, dun, dun. And it's so sad. Like, why are you <laughs> killing Red? Stop doing this to me. You can't kill Red. Um, the treatment was a failure from Spalding Stark. So I want to go back to season four, episode three, Miles McGrath. Do you have some flashback music that we can play? Oh, that'd be awesome. I'll have to find some in post. <laughs> uh, Liz is reading Katarina's journal, and we hear from Katarina these words, right? Today, the doctor confirmed her worst fears. Constantine is going to need blood transfusions to raise his blood count. He's known his entire life that this day might come, but still, it's terrifying. The only blessing is that this accursed disease that has affected his family for generations is passed from father to son and that Masha is safe. This gets reiterated later in the episode as Liz, Tom, and Red are discussing, and then Red says... Constantine has aplastic anemia, a systemic failure to produce viable bone marrow cells. It's been a death sentence for generations of men in his family, except for a distant uncle who had contracted the Rabowski virus after getting the virus. The uncle lived longer than any other Rostov with the blood disease. Mm. Seems very specific now yes. that we have today's episode. Yes. So take that into consideration. What theories are rolling through your brain, Rory, around <laughs> this uh, tie back to this whole disease with Constantine? Okay. So I want to say it goes back to season two. 
Uh, I wanted to go back and listen to the season two podcasts, but I didn't have a chance to. But I think it goes back to about season two, maybe season three, the uncle theory. So originally, the uncle theory to me was Katarina's brother. Okay. But what if it's, we'll call him Alexander Kirk. What if it's Kirk's brother? Ah. Constantine's brother. That would explain Red's illness that all of a sudden now came to the forefront, you know, with it. Because like we said before, last season it was Red's taking medication. You see him taking the shot. Uh, even after she drains his blood out, he specifically tells Dembe to bring stuff, not just blood, that he was infused back with. I want to say it was like yellowish liquid. Well, it'd be plasma, right? He needs plasma right. in order to regenerate his own blood cells. Right. So I think that factors into it, too. Now we're in the for it's in the forefront. So going back to tying all of this together, people always reference the burns on Red's back that we see that was never talked about. Right, right, right. So if it's the uncle, if it's Constantine's brother, he would have been there the night of the fire. That would explain how he got burned, you know, with it. So it also him being sick puts him in the Rostov men getting sick. It explains his relationship with Dom. It explains if Bench Guy is actually Ilya. What if Cat, Kirk, Ilya, and Red were all friends and raised in the same sort of spy school, aka like Tom was? And what if when Red whispered into Kirk's ear is, I'm your brother, and that's why he let him live? That would be another possible solution. So again, everything is a working theory because as we go more and more episodes, things either blow a little hole in your theory or it solidifies it a little bit. I think this kind of brings all of that together. It's possible. Okay, well, let me throw this one out there then. What if Red, because remember in episode two, when they're at Dom's house and Frankie's there and they're having this conversation, they're talking about that he stepped into the Rostov family squabble and everybody right. was like, Oh my gosh, is red a Rostov, right? Right. My wife has an uncle that's about 10 years older than she is. So given the age difference, it could be possible that red might be Constantine Rostov's uncle. And he's been able to avoid the Roboski virus all these years and now maybe just recently has the virus caught up with him. So is it possible that he could have whispered, Hey, I'm your uncle. Mm, that's a, that's a good theory. I mean, it still ties in. It wouldn't be the uncle theory for at least the uncle for Liz theory, but it still would tie everything together because with it. Be you, you go back, you go back to that episode with miles McGrath and you're like, how the hell does red have this very specific information about this family? Right. <laughs> unless, right. And uh, unless he's tied to the family somehow. Exactly. I mean, that has always been the thing was that he always had intimate knowledge and how would he have intimate knowledge unless before he became red, he knew the family intimately, even going back to knowing about Katarina's pregnancy when she was pregnant with Liz you know, it was things like that that made you say, okay, he has some kind of connection going way back, you know, to it. But the only thing with, with that, um, with him being sick with the uncle, using it that way, is that the way she said it in the journal was that he lived longer than, in other words, like that he'd already dead. Got it. And you know what I mean? So he lived longer than most of them did, but he's gone. What this also could tell you, though, is that because we're reading from the journal and then Red immediately says there was an uncle. So you have this whole Katarina said my family is, you know, Constantine's family has always suffered with this virus. And now here's Red saying that he has information about the family. This gives the Red Arena camp another stake in the ground to go. Oh, well, then maybe, you know, this could Red could be Katarina still. Of, of course. I mean, look. It like I said, I've I've never been personally on board with that theory. Not that I'm opposed to it or anything else. It's just it never worked for me. Just like everybody else has their own working theories that they go through. Is it still plausible? Sure. You know, the same way. Look, stick by your convictions. If, if you, you know, like I said, depending on what you know, side of the fence you stand on, you're going to see things to fit your theory. 
You know, and it goes back to the old thing is is seeing facts to make your theory, not using facts to prove your theory. And then the thing to debunk the Red Arena theory would be, well, if Red does have Rabowski in this episode, then he's obviously a male and right. therefore can't be Katarina at the same time. Right. And that's that's the playoff of it, you know, is that they don't mention anything about the women getting it. It was specific to the men. Correct. You know, in there. So, I mean, I think, you know, certain things, you know, I know, I know we we overindulge, we overinterpret a lot of times with things and we read into these things heavy. But that's what the show causes us to do, because we don't know anything to be fact. We're constantly working on a theory and evolving it, you know, and trying to see how it fits what we really believe it is, you know, going forward, whether it's the uncle, whether it's the cousin, the niece, the nephew, Red Arena, whatever it is. Because the other thing, too, is if you look at it, when they talk about the bur- the bombing, maybe that's where the scar on the back comes from. doesn't have to be the night of the fire. could be he was there with the bombing with Katarina. Or the other fire that started to talk about uh, in, in, the, uh, in the Cook episode. Right. So, the, I mean, there's enough things that you can twist and manipulate things, you know, going forward. And until we get concrete answers that on screen they flat out say this is what it is or this is what it isn't. It's all open, open for interpretation. So let's talk about the bench stranger, right? The bench man. Bench Everybody that thinks he might be Ilya. Some people don't think he's Ilya. We'll have to figure that out. But at the same time, we have now uh, this conversation, right? Red says that, you know, you're my friend, right? Yep. And he also, this guy does not want to leave his side because he feels bad for Paris and everything yep. that happened there because he feels, feels like it was his fault. It was interesting, too, because if you you go back to when we initially meet the character, you know, Red says to him, I love you because I can trust you, you know, and, you know, there's an obvious dynamic and they've known each other forever. I am starting to lean into the fact that he is Ilya. It makes perfect sense, especially with the way Katarina looked at the picture and said, now I know I have to go after. It makes sense that he would be Ilya. He has intimate knowledge. I think they both just underestimated Katarina because we still haven't touched on the fact of what Red or whoever Red is supposed to be did to Katarina to make her hate him so much, but still love him at the same time. They also talk about fate. Fate is a big thing that happens in this episode. Yep. Uh, They talk about chance and on their way to Cuba to find an Anatole Karakin, a collector of salt and pepper shakers that we talked about. Release, someone, the <laughs> release the Kraken. Release the Kraken. You are full of it this week. That's pretty I am. I think it's just because I'm running on three hours of sleep. <laughs> oh, there you go. Because you were at the wedding, right? You were there trying to yeah. catch up with Mr. and Mrs. Bloom. Yes, I was trying to get special agent intel from the wedding, but I think that's what it is. On less sleep, I think I'm just punch drunk. Oh, there you go. Makes sense. <laughs> so there, there's that whole conversation on the plane about this this fate and up to chance. So... What do you what do you take of that? Do you think that this is something we should talk about, hang on to, or do you think it was just kind of more words of wisdom from Red? I I, I think that we should be focused on it, but not overly focused on it because fate, chance, at the end of the day, doesn't really matter in the end. Whether it was fate, chance, or you know, pure bad luck. I'll reference John Wick there because he's like, I don't know if it's fate, I don't know if it's chance, or just pure bad luck. You know, that we're in this situation that we're in. So I don't think it really matters. I don't know if we should focus on it too much. Uh, it's just, I think, a way to to bring dialogue to the two characters. So we see more interaction of the two of them. And we did get the uh, the cleaners. The Asian couple shows up. Amazing. They brought the same people back. We haven't seen them in a couple of years. Yeah. So glad, glad they were available <laughs> to, to come on to the episode. <laughs> I mean, I guess they're still on retainer. All right. So let's talk about the fact that. Brett Cullen is in this episode. So is it fate or just chance that he shows up in this episode specifically after we see the picture of Ilya in the drawer? No, I, I think that that's fate for us. I don't think it was chance I, because like I said, again, I, I start, I'm starting to believe that he is Ilya. I said it even going back when they first showed him, I said, that guy, you know, Cullen actually looks like he would be Ilya if he had some, you know, plastic surgery done, let his hair grow a little bit. Uh, with it. So I, I think it's, we're supposed to tie the two together again. Like we said, this episode didn't move the overall storyline, but there's things in there that we're going to need going forward. Yeah. He had a specific line where he was like, I should have known better. 
that right. really kind of stuck out to me as something that was uh, we should really be paying attention to that. Well, that was the whole thing, too, is that, you know, we always said, you know, why did Red go to meet Katarina alone? If Katarina was such a bad person and there was bad blood between the two of them, why would he go meet her in a dark street by himself? And if the stranger said, I should have known that this was going to happen, then he should have known the tendencies, which means he has to really know Katarina or right. this woman playing Katarina. Or he has the intimate knowledge of what happened between the two of them that broke them apart. Oh, that's a good point too. Absolutely. You know, because I do think that he's going to factor in. Now we may not see a lot of him going forward, you know, in many episodes, but I still think we'll see enough and he'll be brought up enough that he's going to be central in this. And at the end of the day, when they break it down and we finally put all the pieces together, we're going to realize he's obviously intertwined intimately with all of these characters. All right. Well, then to close out the episode, Red says, sometimes things happen for a reason. And sometimes I don't know what that reason is. Very accurate line, I think, for this week's episode. Don't you? I, I loved it. I, I, the, the line was so perfectly written and delivered, obviously, you know, with it. But it continues this theme of that the characters on the show, they're not who or what they appear to be. And I think that it also says something to the effect of, what we might think the reason is for the show isn't really the reason at all. And we have questions yet that we haven't even asked. That's really where the show's ultimate mythology lies. Right. Because, I mean, if you tie things back together, again, doing a rewatch really helps because you, you can certain nitpick certain lines from certain episodes that fit that you didn't realize. Like when they're in the shipping container and Red says to Liz, you're my way home again. What did he really mean by that? But now... What's the connection? Because if you think about it with Kirk, you go back to the whole blood thing and the family thing. Kirk wanted to test Liz because Liz could save him. But at the same point, if Red has the same disease and he's really Kirk's brother, then Liz would be able to do that for him, too. Right. So why isn't he using that? And he's, he just, you know, realizing like, OK, I'm going to die. That's it. Nothing could be done for me. I'm going to try every avenue outside except for letting Liz know that we're familiar, you know, that we have a familiar connection. Yeah. Or for some diehard blacklist fans, maybe they don't know what the reason for this episode was because it right. just seemed out of left field. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, again, we, you know, as, as diehard and I, I consider myself a diehard fan of the show, I, I tend to read into a lot of things and there's some things that just don't mean what we want them to mean. They just kind of fit the narrative that we're into. Yeah. All in all, though, it was definitely fun. Yes, chuckle absolutely. The, chuckle, chuckle the good times overall. I think this is probably one we will call up in the filler category at the end of the day when the show is all over. But at least we got a name and we have a, a fish on the line and we'll see where that goes when we keep going next week. Yeah, I mean, they definitely baited us and we have names and we have some information to, to move forward with that obviously I think will come into play, you know, but they delivered the funny tonight which is always good. I always like when they make it a little lighthearted. Yeah. Sometimes you need the break from the yeah. dire and dark that typically is the blacklist. So, right. But either way, just as with every other blacklist episode, there's enough in it to keep the conversation going. But if you happen to run into red Reddington and you give him a piece of information, just beware. You might get shot. Yes. Accidentally. <laughs> just don't put a hair trigger on the, uh, the grip. Well, we want to take a quick second here. Don't go anywhere. We got more show coming up for you, but we want to say thank you to those of us supporting on Patreon. That's P A T R E O N patreon.com slash the blacklist GSM. Wanted to thank all of you for your generous support for helping out the world theater in John's hometown last month. Uh, we'll be making a $500 contribution to the efforts on behalf of the blacklist exposed community. So thank you very much for all of that. Yeah. Very awesome. Awesome community work. Uh, but the work doesn't stop, though. So if you have not yet had a chance to donate to the World Theater, you can head over to the blacklistexposed.com and look for the World Theater logo to give directly all the way until the end of the campaign. In the meantime, we really want to do the show for you live on video, but we can't do that without your support. Head over to Patreon. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash the blacklist GSM. Just two bucks a month from 100 of you or five bucks from you for 40 of you will help us reach that $500 a month goal. 
Again, that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N, patreon.com slash the blacklist GSM. Fill the fedora, get some awesome rewards for yourself, and remember to stay tuned for that special bonus episode of the film discussion of Taking Lives with John Bokenkamp and Aaron, exclusive to our $5 patrons over there on Patreon. Thanks so much for the support, and we'll be back with Red's Rhetoric right after this. Hi, this is Stephen Amell. Hi, I'm Juliana Harkavy, and you're listening to Arrow Squad with Tammy the Chameleon and my favorite, Martin the Flash. That's right. Did you hear that? I'm her favorite. (laughs) You do know I paid her to say that, right? (laughs) No one will ever know. (laughs) Anyways, this is Cammie, and if you love the TV show Arrow like we do, then come join us on Arrow Squad. That's right, and this is The Flash, where each week we break down the episode and share listener feedback. And listen to this, or my fictional alter ego will hunt you down. Enjoy. Hey, this is Amir. I play Aram on The Blacklist, and you are listening to The Blacklist Exposed. All right, welcome to Red's Rhetoric, that part of the show where we feature two of Red scenes from the show this week, and you get to vote, which is your favorite, over on the website. Just look for the post for Norman Devane, or click the link for the online poll in your show notes on your favorite podcast player. Our first clip comes this week as Red talks about salt and pepper. A friend told me you had a keen eye for salt and pepper shakers. She was wrong. You have an exquisite eye. What do you want? I once saw the most adorable little ceramic set in a junk shop outside Topeka. Salt in a straw hat, pepper in a bowler, both delicately balanced on a tiny green hat stand. (laughs) You're a collector. Eh, An admirer of all things precious, including information. What kind of information? Whatever you know about Norman Devane. I don't know anything. As a rule, I also admire loyalty. But as I have pressing business with Mr. Devane, I'm afraid you'll have to make an exception. I don't make exceptions. Perhaps these will change your mind. Technically speaking, they're pepper casters. Handcrafted American silver from the workshop of Paul Revere. Original or replica? I'm surprised you would even ask. Our second comes as Red and the Stranger talk about weddings and fate. Things happen. You a fatalist. Say that for someone who doesn't know you so well. You leave nothing to fate. I try to leave nothing to fate, but I'm perfectly comfortable with chaos. That's why I trust that whatever happens is probably meant to be like accidentally killing a guy and finding he has intel and hog futures. Cosmic, huh? Like you ending up in a velour tracksuit. It looks comfortable as hell, I must say. How about this wedding? I told you I'm not going. Because it's a distraction and has nothing to do with Paris? Well, what if it did? What if the wedding helped us solve Paris? Would you go then? Of course, but it doesn't. Weddings, for the most part, are safe, happy places. Places that even the most skittish source would be comfortable in. You want me to invite the source to the wedding? Drunken revelers, interminable toasting, cheesy cover bands. I can't think of a better place for a covert meeting. I doubt it will work, but I will try. That's all anyone can do. The rest, we leave to fate. Which was your favorite this week? If you like a little salt and pepper in your life, vote hashtag red collector. Or if you think you just go with the flow and deal with the hand you're dealt, vote hashtag red fate. Now it's time for special agent Intel. Well, Brian Gardner had some thoughts on Kuwait. Kuwait gave us our biggest look inside the mythology of the show and told us who red is. It's worth all the hype. He is red. The parallels between Hutton and Red are stunning. Both Navy men, presumed dead, came back to life, changed who they were to survive after horrific life-changing events. So much so that they adopted a new personality to the point where they became different people. And just like Red did after Christmas, Daniel Hutton reintroduced himself to the world or to Cooper as it were a different Daniel Hutton, but still Daniel Hutton. Got me confused there for a second with all the Daniel Huttons. The Johns gave us an answer. The Johns gave us an answer in Kuwait, even with Red's dialogue. Whoever I was then is who I am now. Raymond Reddington. I am who I am. Popeye the Sailor Man. (laughs) 
I don't want to buy into this concept that this is actually Raymond Reddington because we've been told the bones of Raymond Reddington. You didn't have to hide your whole life. Yeah, it, 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 my father's dead and blah, 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 right. blah, blah. So, yeah, could it be possible, I suppose, that the DNA of the bones was changed and therefore that was in order to hide who this really is? But then you sure. get this fantastic story in Rasviat. Like, so I, I, I just I can't I can't wrap my head around the fact that this could have been Raymond Reddington the whole time. Yeah, I think it's just reading into it again, because we've talked about this even before, you know, back in the day when we realized that, you know, Raymond Reddington was really dead, was that whoever this person is that became Red Reddington, whether it's 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, however long it's been, he truly believes that he is Raymond Reddington. He's enveloped that persona and that's who he is. He's not OG Red, but he is now the Raymond Reddington of today. But if you go with what Brian's saying here, I think he's saying Daniel Hutton is Daniel Hutton, right? He did right. reinvent himself as a different person, but he's still Daniel Hutton. I think he's saying Raymond Reddington is Raymond Reddington. He's just Again, a different version of Raymond Reddington. More answers than questions that makes it plausible. It is. It's very true. It's very true. You know, Raymond Reddington died the night of the fire. Right. But I'm he not... was reborn for like a phoenix rising from the ashes as a new Raymond Reddington with a new purpose and a new mission in life. And I'm not your father because right. the father that I was died previously. I, the Raymond Reddington, who was Liz's father, died in the fire and was reborn as the new concierge of crime in Raymond Reddington. So many different things. My <laughs> head is going to explode. I think we just Which need is to, why we need some it's some answers. Right. Like, give us something that solidifies that this is not possible. Well, I think I think that's what we're saying is that we did solidify that it wasn't possible, but yet it's still out there. <laughs> But it still fits the narrative, even though it was told to us that Raymond Reddington is dead. But is it because he adapted himself to a new Raymond Reddington? Okay, I'll buy it for a dollar. Maybe maybe a penny. Maybe four okay. pennies from uh, yeah. Abraham Stern. Yeah, but a dollar's not a lot of money today. So, yeah, But Abraham, Abraham Stern's four pennies were, expensive, were, were worth a lot. <laughs> uh, Ed Meredith checked in and said, The entire show has always shown that the characters we see now are not who they once were. Reddington is not the original Reddington. Liz was once Masha. Harold Cooper is not the Harold Cooper he once was. Hell, even wrestler is not the perfect law abiding FBI agent that we were originally led to believe he was. So with all those facts, it is clear that Katarina is not the original Katarina. In many ways, her character is the same as Red's. It is who she is now, but not who she once was. Much like most of us were not as we appear to be today. So now Katarina was reborn like a phoenix from the ashes. Well, I think that's what people are saying, right? Because she's such a different character on yes. screen than she was previously. And because of that, we are saying like, oh, how could this be Katarina? But maybe it is Katarina. She's just been reborn because of her circumstances. Yeah. I mean, it could be also that because we were before we were introduced to this character, we had this preconceived notion of what she was and who she was. And then especially when you go back and, you know, you see the Cape May episode and then you see the continuation of the Cape May episode to, OK, well, she was a good person once she cared, you know, she helped the woman, you know, in the shelter that she was at. So you think like she was a good person. And now when we're actually introduced to the character, she's like hardcore badass. So it, it was it possible. But that was kind of like what we talked about earlier that, you know, it does appear that every character on the show is not what they once were in some way or another. So I, I know that people think that this isn't a real Katarina, that this is a, a fake Katarina hired to out the towns and directive so that it's clear for the real Katarina. I mean, again, I think we overanalyze things, but again, we don't have answers to close things off. Well, James Steen checked in and said, going back a few weeks ago, about Dom's house. You're telling me that an ex KGB agent would not have a perimeter surveillance system, booby traps, a lot of arms, not to mention a bulletproof vest. <laughs> you know, that's a really good point. <laughs> it is. I guess it's just that, you know, he's been around for so long and just never had a reason to. He's always been safe. He's off the grid. He's using an alias. Nobody ever came looking for him before. So why would he? But funny, remember going back, Aram just showed up at his house and knocked on his door. Well, Frankie showed up at his house and broke in. <laughs> right. So, I mean, it, it does make sense, but I guess if you don't feel threatened, you don't have the need for this stuff. Yeah. At the same time, though, we put double locks on our doors and alarm systems and everything else, and we're not in the KGB. Right. Yeah. I mean, it definitely makes sense. I could see it. 
it's a, it's a, it's a good observation. I'll buy that. Uh, all I can say to that, James, is uh, like grandfather, like granddaughter. Sometimes you're just naive and think you're safe when you're not. <laughs> <laughs> well, Nathan checked in and said, my theory is that both Reddington and the bench guy were both duped by the operative in Paris. We will find out that bench guy is actually Ilya. And this operative that everyone assumes is Katarina isn't the true big bad of the season, but a setup for some bigger players on the board that could have bigger sway than the cabal ever had. Well, it ties back to, you know, when we referenced the map that Red had shown Liz with all the people that it wasn't just a cabal, that there was more things out there that were a threat, you know, with it. So I could see that. Uh, I, again, I believe going forward that Ilya is bench guy. So I'm on board with that. Uh, could it be that there is the Townsend directive is going to be the overall big bad that eventually Katarina is going to come to work? you know, with red or whatever, however it transitions together. I, sure, I could see that. That would be that would be kind of interesting. Gwen Trent chimed in and hopes that Aaron and your family, Troy, feels better soon. Oh, thanks so much for saying that. Yeah, I hope so, too. It's been crazy. I could imagine. Glad I'm uh, kind of far away, so I don't have to worry about that. Dude, you are. For real. <laughs> <laughs> so they want to know if we're going to touch on the lack of red and Liz scenes in season seven. And guess what? We did. Uh, it's becoming a bit worrisome that the two stars are not sharing any screen time. Uh, for some of us, it's very disappointing to wait a week and another week and another week and we don't get any scenes at all. Is that how the show is going to be all season? If so, is it worth sticking with it live or maybe you should just binge watch it? The show's lack of their two stars together seems self-destructive to me. Is it a sign that Spader and Boone don't get along? Well, I wouldn't I wouldn't go there. Don't assume anything no. about onset relationships and all that stuff. I mean, I mean from a narrative perspective, it makes sense because he's pissed off that he she's the reason that all of this started to come to light. And because of that, maybe he's keeping her distance from her uh, right. in that regard. Uh, it ended last season. It seemed like their relationship was kind of at a finite point. Agnes was home. Red doesn't need to be in her life anymore because there wasn't a threat. And he's doing what he needs to do, which is find the people and stop the threat. Right. Yeah, and I think that's also part in, yeah, that plays into it as well is that's why he hasn't told her about Katarina because he wants her. She finally feels safe. He wants her to continue to feel safe, you know, in that sense. And if he brings up like, oh, by the way, Katarina's around, it's the same thing. You know, we didn't talk about it, but when he's referencing and he's talking to the doctor trying to get information, he keeps saying the Russian woman. How does wrestler not pick up on wonder if that's Katarina? That was the only thing that bothered me with that. I'm glad that struck me on that because it. when I was watching it, I'm like, how is wrestler not saying to Red, are the, is a woman you're referencing Katarina? Well, that's because the FBI doesn't ask questions. <laughs> is that part of it? Like you have to sign an NDA, like I'm not going to disclose or question anybody. Well, that's a good point, though. He does say Russian woman. That is true. That is true. Yeah. So I like that was the one thing I picked up on. I should have mentioned it earlier, but this... Uh, this question brought it back to my forefront of my brain because it is still early. But that was the one thing that struck me with the whole episode was that wrestler. And maybe going forward, we'll see that he brings that up somewhere. But how he didn't bring it up at that moment and, you know, and say to him, like, hey, uh, who's this Russian woman you're looking for? Yeah. Frankie said it like Katerina Rostova is your daughter. Right. So and wrestler, somebody who was hunting down, you know, Katerina, which. You know, as people assume, triggered the whole Townsend directive. Right. He's not going to put two and two together. Come on, wrestler. You're better than that. Or at least you were. Absolutely. All right. Uh, Tracy Young said the task force believes that red is Ilya Koslov. The question nobody is asking is how his fingerprints match the real Reddington's. It seems that this would be the first thing the FBI would want to know. Yes, yes, yes. I totally the, agree, Tracy, because I've mentioned fingerprints before. I know other people have mentioned the fingerprints. We need the fingerprint blacklister. Right. I said the same thing that even when they when Liz turned red in, they would have fingerprinted him when he went to jail. That's right. So hello. Get on you now. Know that, hey, room. <laughs> <laughs> something. Uh, I don't know. I mean, with anything, there's always some technology that'll work for that. Well, on Reddit. Jan in Raleigh states lots of good dialogue between red and the stranger on what is meant to be and what is left to chance. But what cannot be coincidence is Elodie picking this particular wedding to crash the stranger's goddaughter's wedding who may or may not be Ilya who, you know, who is looking for coincidence. 
No, bad writing, maybe. Yeah, we I mean, we talked about that. It's like yeah. I I don't know how to take that scene. You know, I don't want Elodie to be a plant, so therefore I'm going to go on the the writing was showing in this one. It was A to B to C. So yeah, remember it was showing everything on screen for a reason. Yep. So we'll just have to see how it plays out. Plays out exactly. All right. Well, that'll conclude this week's episode. The six seasons are on Netflix, so now is the time to recommend The Blacklist to your friend, enemy, neighbor, somebody you want on The Blacklist. And when you do, please also recommend they listen to and subscribe to The Blacklist Exposed podcast. All the case profiles can be found at theblacklistexposed.com and everywhere great podcasts can be heard. For more great Aaron and Troy hijinks, follow us on your favorite social media outlet. I'm at Troy Heinrichs. He's at Aaron Smirks. And together we are the Blacklist GSM. Talk about the show, the podcast, or the last time you hot boxed at school. <laughs> well, big thanks for listening. Don't forget to answer our profiling question. What will Aram do with the intel? Thanks so much, Roy, for being here this week and filling in. Greatly appreciate oh, it. Always. Always. I appreciate it. All right. We'll see you all next week. Hopefully Aaron will be back. Until next time, I'm Agent Troy Heinrichs. That's at Troy Heinrichs on Twitter. And if you want to learn more about me, just visit, well, about.me slash Troy Heinrichs. And I'm Agent Aaron Peterson. You can hear me talking about movies and TV on the Hollywood Outsider podcast, as well as remake this movie, right? We are available at thehollywoodoutsider.com or on Twitter at 5 Popcorn. Be sure to subscribe, download the app, submit your feedback, but most importantly, keep yourself off of The The Blacklist. The Blacklist Exposed is a Golden Spiral Media production. Find more of our great podcasts at goldenspiralmedia.com slash podcasts. Our first clip comes this week as Red talks about salt and pepper and not the band. Pushy, 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 pushy good.